Now, come on. Everybody went to church, so good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right. Right. Kansas City. Don't worry, there won't be offerings being collected or anything like that. That's right. Right. My name is Dr. Mike Hubbard. I'm the director here. Uh, and on behalf of Dr. Troy Pano, the university president, let me extend the warmest of uh, Sunday welcomes to each of you. Uh, and coming out on a uh, rainy day, uh, it's not too cold, but it's a rainy day, we won't talk about too cold, but uh, uh, I, I can't uh, extend uh, a, a warmer welcome. If you get a chance, you want to walk about the building, uh, please feel free to do so. There's a lot of history wrapped into this building, a lot of history that you may uh, or may not know about, so by all means, take your time, walk about, uh, welcome, uh, come back anytime that you want to. Uh, we usually leave the light on, so uh, there should be any issues in that regard. Now, where's Melissa at? I'm going to introduce Melissa uh, Coburn here, who's the chair of the Northern Neck uh, 250. 250 years. That's a long time. Good times, all right. Uh, signature speaker series. So, without further ado, Melissa, it's all yours. Welcome again, folks. Thank you. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Barbara Heath. 
today by thanking Melissa for her invitation. And I wanted to say that a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really based on not only my work, but the work of some of my students at the University of Tennessee. So you'll be hearing a little bit about um, some work that Brad Hatch and Rebecca Webster have done, which are luckily here in the audience to listen and critique. <laughs> and some work that uh, Lord McMillan has done as well. Um, so when Melissa invited me to give this paper or this, this talk, she wanted me to think about and think with you about um, what, how Marylanders moved into the Northern Neck, why they moved here, and um, what the results of that were in the long term. And I think as I, as I started to put this together, the question of who was Maryland and what is Maryland became really central to this talk. Um, and that's really central to all of the things I'm going to talk about today. So, Marylanders have one view of what Maryland was in the 1630s through 1650s in Virginians, or at least a group of Virginians had a very different view of that. So just quickly to return to the first map, because I have a couple of folks asking questions about this. This is a 1640s map of Virginia that was done by a Dutch visitor, and it's actually kind of emblematic of the conversation and conflict that was going on in this period. Um, all of the green area is um, indicated by the Dutch map makers being Virginia, but anybody familiar with the history of this area knows that much of the upper portion of that map was claimed for the Maryland colony. So in the 1640s, all of that was up for grabs, and, and so we're going to talk about uh, how, archaeologists, how archaeology can help us understand that. All right, so um, Virginia was originally a vast stretch of land. Um, encompassing all of the land down to um, what's now about the end of North Carolina, South Carolina, and then running north up into what's now Northern Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, and what happened over the intervening years after it was first, um, uh, sorry, it was first charted, um, became the issue of the, or the topic of my talk. And the other piece of this I want to talk about is the idea of borderlands. Because I think borderlands are something that anthropologists and historians talk a lot about. And borderlands really capture the fluid and um, dynamic nature of, especially the Potomac River Valley in the 17th century. Borderlands are places that are away from the center. So the center of Virginia would have been the Jamestown area. The center of Maryland would have been St. Mary City area. The Potomac was a place <coughs> in between those colonial powers. And it was also a border or a uh, frontier of the English Empire um, that was in, responsible for settling and colonizing this area. And so thinking about borderlands as a place of possibilities, a place of transformation, a place of, um, of difference from those settled poor area is an important part of how I've been thinking about the Northern Neck. All right, so before we get into that, I wanted to set the stage because when the English arrived here, they didn't arrive in a place that had no history. There was a deep history in the Potomac, and it really influenced what happened when the English arrived. So we're going to start off at a site that I've been involved with, which is uh, in Northumberland County, County, just north of uh, Heathsville, uh, along a stretch of water called Boathouse Pond. And starting about 200 AD, uh, bands of people who were hunter-gathering, fisher peoples, um, settled along this bank of the Cone River, and they, uh, over time, along with other people living on the northern neck, uh, developed horticultural systems, um, so they became much more village-based, and um, they started to develop distinct communities along the stretches of the northern neck. Sometime uh, in the period from about 1200 to 1400 AD, uh, numerous groups from uh, further north that were Iroquoian speaking people started coming south because they were facing land pressures and, and conflict in their home region. So they started trying to move into the Potomac Valley. And so we have a period of conflict um, and a period of new ideas and new practices entering, um, and these people intermingled with folks that were already living here. Um, and so we're seeing little hints of this in the archaeological record. We spent several winters uh, doing archaeology along the banks of Boathouse Pond uh, as part of a project that was funded by the Department of Historic Resources because the pond is causing a lot of erosion to these indigenous sites. And we found a number of um, artifacts and some clusters of places that looked like they were the main areas of, of use and habitation. And those clusters are outlined here in the middle slide of the slide with the red circles. 
Uh, and so one of the interesting things that uh, Rebecca Webster was able to do was by looking at ceramics that were recovered from these areas um, and comparing them to sites uh, from other locations in the Potomac River Valley and in other parts of Southern Maryland. She was able to see through the ceramics evidence of the coming together of these different groups of people. So people who were living further west, who had been influenced by the um, migration southward by the Iroquois speakers, were making pottery that was predominantly tempered with brick, and people that were living in the eastern part of the northern neck uh, were drawing on the shell resources here and were making pottery that was tempered with, with shell. And what we found in Boathouse Pond are some potters that were making pots made out of bowls. So we think what we're seeing here is these two separate traditions or community, what we call communities of practice, coming together, people living uh, on the same uh, piece of property, uh, perhaps intermarrying, and creating this kind of hybrid form of pottery that, that encompasses both of their traditions. Um, the, so the second Cohen um, grew out of these groups of folks. They were the groups that were identified um, in the early 17th century as, as living on this piece of land along Boathouse Pond. And they persisted and remained there um, into the 17th century. And over time, they started moving closer uh, to the main body of the Cone River. And we found archaeologically that sometime around 1610 to 1620, their leader, a man named Mashua, um, constructed a palisaded enclosure, a fenced area, uh, in the middle of a field. And probably inside of that enclosure was his dwelling, uh, the dwelling of some of the community priests, uh, a warehouse perhaps where things were being stored. Um, and this was the central place of that village. There were other members of the community who lived away from that palisaded enclosure, but they all lived within about five or six, um, or within a, sorry, maybe a thousand foot radius around that. So we go from Boathouse Pond sort of closer to the Cone River. Um, and so in this slide, I also show you a little bit of the evidence that we have. The kind of uninteresting map with the black line is, a, is as much of, a, of the outline of that palisaded enclosure that we found. It measures about 91 feet going north-south and about 63 feet going east-west. Uh, and then we have an image of a deer metatarsal, which somebody used as a way of processing deer skin hides. So we know that people were uh, hunting and, and manufacturing hides at the site sometime in the 17th century. And then we have just an image at the bottom of what the palisade looked like before we excavated it, and then a slide of some folks doing the excavations, looking for the path of that palisade. So that's kind of what was happening uh, in a very small space along the northern neck, just on the eve of English settlement. So I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about uh, what happened to England in, when they settled in Virginia and how that influenced what was happening on the northern neck. So in the early 17th century, um, as I mentioned earlier, the term Virginia referred to a very large area of land. And in 1606, King James I granted a royal charter to a group of businessmen um, who were to select land, and they would have control over that land uh, within a series of boundaries that the king set. And from the place that they chose to settle, they would have control over all of the land and all of the activities, and they would govern an area of about 50 miles. So they chose to settle at Jamestown. And the yellow line shows 50 miles north of Jamestown, and it hits just above the Rappahannock River. So technically, the northern side of the northern neck, or the Potomac Valley, fell outside of that initial charter. And that was a piece of land that was beyond um, the jurisdiction of Jamestown. Um, so in 1608, John Smith took a group of men uh, by boat and explored all of the inlets and rivers along the uh, western part of the uh, of Virginia. And the places that I've underlined are some of the indigenous villages where he um, came into contact with people. Uh, the second line up from the bottom is, is uh, Chickacoan or Chickacoan, which is where the folks were living that I was just talking about uh, earlier. And he mapped where all of the major settlements were. So you can see, or hopefully you can see, associated with the names of those villages are little house-shaped or log house-shaped uh, symbols. And those are telling us that those were the major uh, centers of settlement along the Potomac. Um, in 1609, uh, the, the English got a new charter to Virginia. 
and that vastly expanded the claims so that they stretched all the way north um, into what's now Pennsylvania and all the way west. Um, but still, the area of the northern neck was pretty far outside of the area of concern for the settlers in Jamestown. When, they, uh, when the settlers were, were getting uh, established, they were facing a lot of conflict with the Powhatan, who were the indigenous group in southern uh, Virginia, who they came um, up against and who they interacted with, in some cases cooperatively, but in many cases uh, not so cooperatively. So we have a series of um, conflicts starting in the early 17th century uh, between the Powhatan and the English. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about whether the people living along the northern neck, the indigenous people along the northern neck, were part of that Powhatan uh, sphere of influence. And we have little hints that suggest that, this, that they may have been on the periphery of the Powhatan's influence, but they may have themselves been sort of part of this borderland society <coughs> where they weren't under the control of Powhatan, nor were they under the control of people living in southern Maryland. Um, we see this both by their willingness to trade with the English um, from Jamestown, even at a time when the Powhatan weren't trading with the English. And in 1622, right before there was a uh, Powhatan uprising against the English, uh, the second Cohen um, learned of this and they warned some English traders who were in the vicinity uh, not that, that this was going to happen and to be careful and to, and to take care of themselves. So that suggests that they, were, they didn't have the same interests or the same um, violent feelings towards the English that, that the Powhatan did at that time. Okay, so during the 1620s, the English started spending a lot more time in the upper reaches of the bay. They started exploring uh, uh, the Chesapeake Bay up to what's now the, the entry of the, of the bay. And um, they decided that this would be a very lucrative area uh, for settlement, not for tobacco cultivation, which is what was happening largely in the southern part of Virginia, but for exploiting animal skins, and especially beaver pelts. So furs were very valued in Europe. People were making hats and other goods out of fur, and they were there was a large market for that. It was, it was something that people could do um, that was a totally different enterprise than uh, agriculture, but could yield equally you know, successful results. So in 1637, a man named William Claiborne, sorry, 1631, a man named William Claiborne settled on Penn Island and brought a number of men from the eastern shore up there. And he established a fur trading outpost in collaboration with some London merchants. He was working there at a building and uh, enterprise there, um, right at the, on the eve of the time when Maryland was settled. Um, and so, just as he was developing his fur trade, um, the king gave uh, land of Maryland um, to the Calvert, and that then became a source of, of conflict. So, um, from the early 16. Uh, mid 1630s to the late 1630s, there was a long-standing um, debate over, and, and military military debate as well over who should control Penn Island. Was that Virginia land or was that Maryland land? Uh, according to Calvert, the land was settled, and the um, Charter of Maryland said that Maryland only took in unsettled land. So, from his perspective, this remained Virginia. From Calvert's perspective, this was in the larger grant that the king had given him, and this was one of his motivations for settling in Maryland. He saw the, the potential of the fur trade, and so he was very adamant that he wanted to take control of Kent Island. So there were a number of um, small-scale military skirmishes in the bay uh, over control of shipping furs, and eventually Calvert got the upper hand and took over Kent Island. And over the next several years, Kent Island people started to leave the island and, and relocate. So where did they go? Some of them went back to St. Mary's cities. Others of them went south into Virginia. And um, during the 1640s, a number of Virginians were starting to expand north from the James River Valley and the York River Valley into area that had been known as Indian country, and which several treaties had um, said that should remain Indian country. Um, so we have a period of expansion in the early 1640s, followed by a third anglo powhatan war where the Powhatan tell the English that they can't settle here and force them back towards the York River. And then slowly we start to see expansion again north as far as the Rappahannock. But again, the northern part of the um, northern neck along the Potomac is kind of left out of these relationships. So in, six, in the early 1640s, uh, we have the establishment of a community 
hot chicken column. And that's the area that I've been doing with my, much of my research. So it was settled between the Cone River, um, which is where the second Cohen Indian village was, and an area called Cupid's Creek, um, with the Potomac River forming the northern boundary. And um, we don't know exactly when, we, when it was settled, but we do know there were a number of people from Kent Island who had been allied with Claiborne, who moved down and formed the core of that settlement. Um, we also know that uh, a man named John Matra, who became sort of the, um, the leader of the Chickacoan settlement, is first appears in the records for this area in 1643. And we know that William Claiborne, who had gone to England to plead with the king to get, regain his control of Kent Island, returned to Virginia in 1643. So it seems like there's a confluence of sort of circumstantial evidence that suggests that the Chickacoan settlement uh, was begun by Matram and a number of people coming down from Kent Island or across from St. Mary's after they had relocated from Kent Island um, sometime around 1643. And they took over the name uh, Chickacoan, they anglicized the name that had, the second Cohen had had uh, previously. So they sort of laid claim to the history of this place uh, by taking that name. So, this place remained for the next maybe 20 years as a really important borderland. And it's interesting if you look at the records, the people that lived there themselves didn't consider themselves to be Virginians and they didn't consider themselves to be Marylanders. They, there's, these are just some examples of what I found in the documentary evidence from the court records that talk about a number of people going to Virginia. So even though they are legally in Virginia, they think of themselves as, as something apart. Um, and for the first few years of the Chickacoan settlement, they, they were an unincorporated place. Uh, after 1648, they became part of the county of Northumberland. But that idea that they weren't Virginians, or they weren't Maryland, they were something else, uh, persisted. And I've also just recently started looking through the records for Maryland, and I'm finding similar information for the people that were living at Kent Island. They talk about going to Maryland when, they talk, when they're meaning they're going to St. Mary City. Um, or going to Virginia in earlier periods. So it's interesting that that perception of, of being apart um, is, is evident in the records. So in sometime around 1643, Matram settled um, at, on this land just along the edge of the Cone River near the second Cone village. And we think he did that in collaboration or cooperation with the railroads of the, of the second Cone. So they, they negotiated for him to have this land. And archaeologically, it seems that the people living on this property, the indigenous people, stayed here uh, up until the 1650s. So we have an English settlement um, side by side with this second Cone village. Um, and we have some archaeological evidence of that. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But Cone Hall became the center of the Chicken Cove community. So it became um, a place where court was held on a monthly basis. It became a place where the minister uh, came, whether he did services in the house is unclear, but he stayed in the house when he was visiting this area. We don't think there was a permanent church here yet, so we had an itinerant uh, minister who would come and preach. Um, there was a store here that was called Matram Store, where people could buy goods coming in on the ships from England, and also where they could bring their tobacco to be picked up to be shipped to England. So it was, a, it was a central place of the community. So archaeologically, we've been looking at a number of different um, deposits, which we call features, that are sort of scattered across the early um, Montreux period landscape. And I want to talk to you about two of them today. Uh, the one in the upper corner here is a, a small pit that was excavated a few years ago. And the other one, with the star that's closer to the river, uh, is depicted in the other slides. So we have a large, um, shallow cellar. It's about 44, 44 to 45 feet long, about 15 feet wide. Um, it's relatively shallow. The upper layers of it are filled with material that was thrown away sometime in the 1660s or 1670s. But the deeper layers have, met, have earlier um, artifacts that suggest that it was deposited in the 1640s or 1650s. And we're still working on this. We've done portions of it, but we have more work to do. Um, but right now, these two features seem to be the earliest two features related to the English occupation of, um, of Chickacoan that we've yet found. Um, so we, we think that this cellar had various kinds of activities happening in it. 
and the lower layers represent material that was either left in place when the building was abandoned, or material that washed in from right around the edges before the, the hole that was the remains of the cellar was filled in. Um, so what have we found so far? We have large amounts of indigenous made materials, so a lot of tobacco pipes. Uh, we have hundreds of indigenous tobacco pipes from the site in general, and probably 75% of them are coming from one of these two areas of the site. We have a lot of locally made pottery um, that was also made by indigenous people that was probably used to contain corn or other foodstuffs that were sh shared with the um, folks that lived at Cone Hall. Um, but we, and we have some lithics and other Native American artifacts. Um, but we also have some early English artifacts showing up here and, and some Dutch artifacts as well. So out of the fill at the bottom, near the bottom of the pit, we have two English patent farthings, uh, which were minted in England probably in the 1630s. Uh, we have the, this two-headed eagle that was part of a seal that was put on a bottle. Uh, we don't have an exact date for that, but a very similar two-headed eagle seal was found um, just off the edge of Kent Island in the water several years ago, and it has a 1593 date on it. So this, that symbolism of the two-headed eagle seems to have persisted into the 17th century and, and be present at Cum Hall. Um, we also have some Dutch brick. The one in the far corner doesn't look like a very exciting artifact, but for us it is because most of what we're finding um, architecturally at the site are, are locally made or English-style bricks. But people were importing bricks from the Netherlands, um, and they tend to show up um, in southern Maryland. This is the only one that I'm aware of that's been found. Uh, on the northern neck, well, there's, there's a group of bricks that have come out of this feature, but this is the most intact one. Um, and then just uh, some buttons that um, perhaps speak to the, um, the aesthetic of the people that were living at the site. So I want to talk a little bit about um, Protestantism and Puritanism in a, in a minute. Another really important group of artifacts that we found are things related to firearms. So we have probably 75 pieces of lead shot that we've dug at the site over the years. But again, the majority of those pieces of shot are found either in the pit that was, um, the small pit that was excavated that's early, or the cellar feature. And we have different sizes, and likely a lot of it was used for hunting. But we have several large pieces of shot that, that could have been used in military uh, firearms. We also have um, a, a number of gun flints that were used in, in firearms and um, some screws. So this slide at the bottom here, this long, narrow piece of lead, is a piece of waste lead from making lead shot. So somewhere close to this building or within one of the rooms of the building, people were, were producing um, lead shot and they were making gun flints. And that very likely could have been for hunting purposes and for the, the um, skins and fur trade. But we also think that it might connect um, to the intercolonial conflict that was happening right around the time that this part of the site was occupied in the 1640s, early 1650s. So during the, um, William Claiborne returns from England in 1643. And this is at the very beginning of the English Civil War. And um, shortly thereafter, there's a, a conflict in um, Maryland where a man named Richard Ingle, who's a British or English merchant, um, comes into conflict with some of the colonial officials in Maryland. He leaves uh, the colony for a while, and then he returns. And he comes to Chickacoan, and he recruits <coughs> men from Chickacoan to join him as mercenaries to cross the river and to overthrow the Maryland government. So somewhere between 12 and 15 men from Chickacoan meet with Ingle at Matram's house, and within you know, the next day or two, they cross the Potomac, and they oust Calvert from, um, from his leadership, he flees the colony and goes to Virginia, and they basically take over Maryland for two years. At the same time that this is happening, Claiborne is also recruiting people from Maryland, uh, I'm sorry, from Chickacolin, to go to Kent Island, and he's trying to get them to retake Kent Island for him. Uh, he's not successful in that. So this conflict, you know, works out well for the, uh, for, for the um, Protestant-backed groups attacking Calvary and St. Mary's, but not so well um, for the folks attacking Kent Island. So we have a little bit of archaeological evidence across the river for Ingalls Rebellion, um, which is a site in St. Mary's City, which was originally inhabited by Calvert himself, but then during the period of uprising um, was occupied by the man Nathaniel Pope. And he fortified an area around the house, and that was the central place where the rebels 
um, lived and brought their plunder. This period is called the plundering time in Europe. So they would go from plantation to plantation and they would steal people's cattle and horses and household goods and burn houses down. And they basically were trying to establish uh, a more egalitarian government in Maryland. They were anti-king. They were siding with the parliamentarians in, in England during the war. Um, they were anti-proprietary system. They wanted a more um, parliamentarian-based government. So for two years, they tried to impose that on Maryland, and then Calvert regained power in 1646, and the rebellion ended. And it ended relatively peacefully. So returning to Cone Hall, after that period of really intense intercolonial violence in the late, 18, the late 60s, sorry, 1640s, uh, we have a period of relative peace and prosperity. Um, Montreux built a larger house. It is a two-story, um, 25 by 55 foot house, which is really large for that time period in Virginia. It has a central hearth two or three rooms, and a very large cellar on one end of the house. So we've excavated the outline of that house and a part of the cellar. And at the bottom is a conjectural floor plan of John Luker's house, who was a, a secretary of Maryland, so uh, somebody that the rebels would have attacked during the plundering time. And John Montrem built a house that's almost the exact replica of Luker's house. And I think in, I've, we've spent some time thinking about what this house means, and we think in part it is perhaps a challenge to Maryland saying that Chicka Cohen has somebody you know, who is powerful and wealthy and influential living there. Um, but it also is sitting right on top of where that Native American palisade was. So there's another message going on there as well. And we've interpreted this as meaning that they're literally taking the, the sort of power of the place that the uh, Chicka Cohen railroads had at that site and claiming it for themselves, for England, and making Matra sort of the, the lord and the, the most important person uh, in this community. We've talked a lot about people from the uh, Kent Island area moving into Chickacombe, but I wanted to spend a couple of minutes anyway talking about some other folks that came here as well. So not everybody who lived here was from Maryland. Um, we don't really know where Matram came from himself. We've been doing a lot of research. There's a lot of ideas out there about who where he may have come from, but we don't know for sure. Um, but we do know his second wife, Ursula Thompson uh, Matram, was a Kent Island widow. Her husband, uh, Richard Thompson, was from Kent Island. Um, we know that Richard Wright was an Englishman who was a merchant and trader who lived on the property. We know an unnamed minister was there. We don't know much more about him. And we know Mr. Hawkins ran the store. And there were several Hawkinses that were in Kent Island. They never tell us the name of Mr. Hawkins at Chickacone, so it's hard to know exactly which Hawkins he was. Um, so they were a fairly unified group with, with strong, uh, strong Maryland connections. But then if you look at the people that worked for Matra, the people that were bound laborers, you get a slightly different story, or a very different story. So Matram was one of a handful of elite people in Northumberland County who actually owned slaves in the 1650s. Uh, and the first four people, or actually the first three people on this list, are enslaved Africans. They, their lives would have been influenced um, by violence that was happening in West Africa that resulted in captives being taken as part of the slave trade and then being brought and sold um, largely to the Caribbean and to other places, but some of them uh, made their way to Virginia, aboard slave ships, and were sold in the colony. So we don't know where these folks were from, but we know that their being in, in Virginia at this time was a result of violence you know, halfway across the world. Elizabeth Key, maybe somebody that you know, you know, she's, her name has lived on in history. She was a woman who was the daughter of an Englishman, a man named Thomas Key, and an African woman who was probably one of the first Africans to arrive in Virginia. Elizabeth was born in 1632, and her father um, sold her time into um, indenture to a man named Humphrey Higginson. And Higginson somehow traded her time to uh, John Mottram. We're not sure how she ended up at Cone Hall. But when Mottram died in 1655, Elizabeth Key went to court and said that she believed that she should be free. Um, that she had served her time of indenture, and that there was no reason that she should remain uh, in bondage. And so she brought to the court a couple of arguments. Uh, one important one was that her father was an Englishman and that she should be uh, free because she was also an English person, and that her father was a Christian and that um, the law forbade Christians from being held as slaves. 
So the local court uh, did not with, uh, uphold her claim to freedom, but they um, had her go to Jamestown to the um, colonial court, and the colonial court judged in her favor. And she was eventually freed and married uh, William Grinstead, who's the name right below her on the list, who was another one of um, Matrim's indentured servants. Uh, so she went with her, following her freedom, she went and settled elsewhere on the Northern Neck and, and remained there for the rest of her life. The remaining people on the list are people uh, who were Englishmen or uh, other Europeans who sold their time into indenture in order to get passage to the New World and to um, work for a period of years and hoping to gain their freedom and become um, planters themselves. So several of them are, uh, were came as adults, but others came as children. So George Slyven, John Warner, Thomas West, and Thomas Hammond are all described in the, document, in the documentation as boys. And um, John, sorry, Thomas Hammond was an Irishman. He was a, he was a child from Ireland. Uh, and they remained in service to Matrim's family after Matrim's death. Following Matrim's death, his son inherited the property, and the house was, as I said, occupied into the 1680s. And so we see a transition from the time where Matrim was heavily involved with indigenous people and involved in the fur trade to a period where this is becoming a, a more sort of standard Virginia plantation. Uh, with an emphasis early on in tobacco cultivation and then slowly by the 1670s and 80s shifting to also the incorporation of, of English grains like wheat and barley and oats, which constituted a different kind of labor regime, a different kind of agricultural cycle. And that is something they also have in, in common with people that were working in Maryland. Uh, Virginia, Southern Virginia continued to be heavily involved in tobacco cultivation into the 18th century, but we see the beginnings of a shift in agriculture happening on the northern deck um, starting about the 1670s or 1680s. And we found evidence of that archaeologically. We actually find burned wheat seeds and burned other kinds of grains that can show us that this was happening in this particular place. Okay, there's just a few more sites I wanted to talk to you about. So we said, I've talked a lot about Cat Island this afternoon. I also wanted to talk about some areas that are a little bit closer to you, um, an, an area that was settled in the 1640s called Appomattox or Nominai. Um, and the people that settled here were rebels that had been part of England's rebellion. After Calvert reclaimed authority of um, Maryland, they decided they didn't want to stay in Maryland. So they crossed the river and created the settlement. Um, and they were closely aligned with the folks of Chickacullen, but they, for reasons of their own, they decided they were going to settle further up the river. Um, so some of these people uh, were John Hallows. Uh, and Thomas Speak, John Hallows settled at what we call the Hallows site, Thomas Speak settled at Nominai, and then others that were part of this wave of migration uh, were Nathaniel Cope, uh, whose daughter married John Washington, um, Thomas Baldridge, Walter Broadhurst, Sam Smith, and I'm using some uh, research here that was done by um, Brad Hatch and Lauren McMillan several years ago that were establishing those ties between Appomattox and the Ingalls Rebellion folks. Um, Sorry, let me just go back quickly. Another settlement that happened just shortly after the founding of Romani and Appomattox is actually further up the bay in um, Maryland, and that was called Providence. After Ingalls' rebellion, Calvert decided that it was in his benefit um, to make Maryland less allied with the Catholic faith and to show that it was a colony that was welcoming to people of all faiths. And so he encouraged um, the governor, uh, William Stone, to bring Virginians who were um, Puritans into Maryland and to settle at Providence. And so that community was settled right about just a little bit after Nominai and Appomattox were settled. Okay, so archaeology was, has been done at John Hallow's site. Back in the 1960s, the late 60s, a group of folks went out there um, prior to a house being built and did a salvage project where they found the remains of the house and they didn't have a chance to do a full analysis of the artifacts, so many years later uh, we brought the artifacts uh, on loan from the Department of Historic Resources to the University of Tennessee, and we analyzed them and wrote a report on them. And one of the misconceptions that had arisen over time, because people hadn't had a chance to really closely look at the site, was the idea that the site dated from the later 17th century, and um, we were able to demonstrate that it actually is connected with this Ingalls Rebellion group of migrants uh, and was established in the late 1640s. So one of the most remarkable things about this site is this kind of hybrid house 
that combines a standard hall parlor English house with fortifications. There are other fortified sites in Virginia, but typically the fortifications are away from the house, and the house is sitting inside of some kind of enclosure. At Hallows, the fortifications are actually built into the gable ends of the house. So we have two bastions, um, one very large one um, on one side and a smaller one on the other. We did some analysis um, of where this sat in space, and we believe the larger bastion was closer to the river and facing um, out. So if you were coming up the Potomac, that was the first thing you would see. And we believe that Hallows fortified his house either in anticipation of retaliation from uh, Maryland or as just a symbolic kind of I'm armed and ready, you know, don't mess with me kind of uh, statement. Uh, but this is a really unique house uh, in Virginia uh, and an interesting statement about the politics of the time uh, as well. So some of the artifacts that came from Hallows and the phenomenon, which is just uh, down the river a little bit, um, speak again to Hallow's involvement and probably Speak's involvement with the Indian trade. We have trade beads that are uh, beads that were common and popular among Indian traders in the early part of the 17th century. We also find at all three sites these curious kind of ridged pipes uh, that were made by the Susquehannock. So these were the people that the English were trading with um, at Kent Island in the fur trade, and their pipes are coming down the Chesapeake Bay and ending up on these sites along the Potomac. Um, they may simply be a reflection of these trade relationships, but I also wonder if they're not also speaking to the politics of the time. The English fur traders were allied with the Susquehannock, but the Maryland proprietary governor, government was not. The, the Susquehannock were seen as enemies to the government. And I'm wondering if the use of these pipes was also part of those kind of political divisions that were going on. Uh, Lauren McMillan has made the case that other mass-produced pipes were making political statements. So these are some pipes that have the symbol of the English Tudor Rose on them. And the Tudor Rose obviously was associated uh, with the Tudor kings. Um, and they were, became symbols that were associated with English Protestants who were sort of standing up to the excesses of um, King Charles I, and they became widely, this symbol became widely adopted among English people who had emigrated out of England because of political tr troubles leading up to the uh, English Civil War. And we see these showing up on Dutch pipes, and we also see these symbols showing up on pipes being made in the colonies. So all of these pipes are found on the sites, um, so far anyway, associated with uh, people involved in Eagles Rebellion on the side of the Protestants. We don't have Tudor Rose pipes at Cohen Hall, but we do have this Tudor Rose pewter button, which would have served much the same function as being something that, was, that could be seen and, and worn in public and people could sort of get a sense of um, your political alliance that way. And here I'm going to venture even further out onto a, uh, onto a limb and talk about politics. But we have this interesting artifact that we're just now starting to, to look at. Um, what we have are pieces of a chamber pot that uh, we found five of them in the Chesapeake so far. Two in Providence, which was that uh, Puritan stronghold that was in the northern part of the bay. One at the Hallows House, one at Cone Hall, and one at Jamestown. So the central motif of this seal is the figure that you can see on the far side of the site, uh, which looks like a man with a goatee that's kind of bent forward. And around him is the, is the saying in German, uh, I salute my dearest love with an affectionate kiss. Um, this seal shows up on uh, bottles, but it also shows up on chamber pots. And we know in the 18th century that people used kind of body humor by putting all kinds of things on chamber pots that were anti-king, anti-royal. Um, and this is perhaps a, a symbol of that same anti-royal uh, or anti-authority um, sentiment happening in the 17th century that we see sort of playing out in these Puritan or Protestant um, allied sites. And that may be totally wrong, I'm just starting to think this through. But the, the um, confluence of where they're found, the time period they're found, and who they're found with is, cer is certainly interesting. Okay, so I want to end my talk today with talking about a, the last site um, that we looked at at UT uh, called Newman's Neck. So this was a site that was found uh, back in the 1970s, around the same time that Cone Hall was first discovered. It was excavated as a salvage project in the 19, late 1980s. 
And uh, we took the collections at the University of Tennessee to analyze those as well because they had never been looked at uh, systematically. And uh, we know Newman was uh, an early settler of Chickacol, and he uh, established his household there sometime in the 1640s. And his um, son, uh, his son-in-law, was also uh, associated with Kent Island. So again, part of this group of political people settling together. Uh, we think the house itself was actually a little bit later than that. The Newman house um, may have been lost to erosion. But this house was probably built uh, by his granddaughter's husband. And it's a large posting ground house. In the center of the slide, you can see kind of a, where the range pole is. You can see kind of a red stain. That's where the uh, chimney would have been. There's a small cellar on one side. And then all of those large holes represent places where posts were set in the ground for the walls of the house. Um, the map shows an early layout of the property. There was the main house with an addition and then uh, a kitchen next to it, some small outbuildings, uh, a tobacco barn, and then an enclosed work area just off the house. Um, we know that by the time this house was built, the landowners owned both uh, the time of indentured servants and also a number of slaves. And as we move later into the occupation period of this site, uh, there's a growing uh, population of enslaved people and a growing um, reliance on, on agriculture again rather than the fur trade which Newman was involved in early on. And so here's a later map of some of the buildings that were standing at the site showing a, a servant or slave quarter um, on the lower side of the slide and then some outbuildings as well. So Newman's deck kind of <coughs> indicates the transition um, away from the, the fur trade and um, heavy reliance on indigenous cooperation and political conflict across the river that characterizes the middle of the 17th century into a more stable settled later 19th early later 17th early uh, 18th century plantation economy. Okay, I want to just end today by saying that the Northern Neck has incredibly rich archaeological and historical resources and it's largely untapped. If you look at other areas of Virginia, there's been, a, especially um, around Jamestown and Williamsburg, there's been a large amount of archaeology done for many, many years. And the Northern Neck has a different story to tell. It has a different set of influences on it and a different set of economic and social relations going on. And yet we only have a handful of sites to really interpret this history. Uh, today I've talked about almost all of them. I haven't talked about the Washington site and the Burke site um, because I thought those might be touched on by later speakers, but we, there's so much more we can learn about this place, and I think the time is coming now where, where we really need to be thinking about future planning. Um, we've already lost some of these sites, as I mentioned earlier, to construction, and there's been a fair number of salvage projects, but now we're also up against the effects of um, more intensive storms, uh, water levels rising, fields flooding, erosion happening. And um, both the indigenous sites, like you can see here at Boathouse Pond, and also the early colonial sites are really endangered. So I hope that as part of a lot of the heritage um, initiatives that are arising on the Northern Neck around the 250th birthday, around being a named heritage um, area, and other local initiatives will focus on archaeology as well as the standing landscape and try and come up with a plan and a way of, of trying to save some of these sites for the future. So thank you very much.